All right. All righty. Uh, apologies to the delay. All right, does everyone have the filled up? All good. All right. So uh, today, um, we're, uh, the topic we're going to talk about is uh, persistent storage and networking, uh, especially more networking, since that's going to be very important to have challenge. Um, so some announcements. Um, we're going to send out an announcement soon about the hack challenge. Um, it's going to have a lot of information that uh, pertains to you all. Um, it is uh, like dates, forms, stuff like that. The uh, idea submission form is going to open uh, probably very soon. I think it might be open. We'll send it to you guys in the announcement, I believe. Um, but there's other things um, that are important in the announcement. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, and so the timeline. So this timeline, I'm talking about lectures. So like exactly seven days from now at this time. Um, uh, during the time where lecture usually is, we're going to have the Hack Challenge kickoff. So, and everyone is required to come. So, well, when you guys come next week, there won't be lecture, but there'll be a lot more people from all of the other classes uh, attending the kickoff of the Hack Challenge. Um, and the following week is uh, our bonus lecture, which we've um, confirmed based off of what we saw from the forum. So, we're going to do um, game development. If you go to Android game development, and you can learn how to apply the skills you use uh, for Android development into uh, a game engine. Um, and uh, one of our active members from the Android team, Corwin, is going to uh, present on that. And that's going to be one point of uh, extra credit on your final grade uh, for attendance. So please try to come out. Um, and uh, the Hack Challenge office hours will then be the following week during our lecture time. Uh, after that. So the today is the last official lecture and the last bonus lecture is the 15th. Um, but other than that, it's just hack challenge stuff. Um, so uh, for the hack challenge, we're going to have uh, each group uh, paired up with mentors. So uh, people will be Android mentors, backend people will have their own backend mentors, and you can message these people about questions you have when you're building your apps. Um, so there is um, a, a back end also that we're going to use for homework today. So uh, we've worked with um, uh, Gonzalo from the back end team, and he's uh, created a back end for you all to use for homework six. So homework six will use networking. Um, people can post notes, and you can do your other classmates are posted. Um, there is, uh, and we'll talk more about that um, in the demo and stuff like that. Uh, so there is. Uh, no cap on homework split days for homework six, um, especially since this is the last homework and um, after this is half challenge and you guys don't have much to submit until like the 20th of um, November. So you can use as many of the, so if you have like five split days left, uh, feel free to use all of them if you, if you want. Um, but uh, uh, split days are not usable for the half challenge. That's um, an important point. So after this homework, there is no utility for keeping your Days. And um, we're going to have a uh, end of course feedback form that will be due with um, homework six. So when you submit homework six, make sure you submit the feedback form too. This three points of your final grade, I believe. Okay. Um, uh, any logistic questions before we dive into um, review about high challenge or anything like that? Yeah. Is the, is the kick off next week? Okay. The same time as we have breakfast day. Yeah, so uh, exactly seven days from now. It's going to be 835 Monday breakfast. Okay, Um. so uh, no more questions? Yeah. Uh, we've had people who are in two classes before, and I think you just choose one, or we make you choose one depending on what the more demand. I'm guessing we're probably going to make you do anything because, like, uh, there's people. Um, any other questions? Um, so uh, let's review lecture five. So we learned that fragments are um, more modular than activities and um, sort of more efficient, um, more uh, disposable, I guess you could think of. Um, and they allow for us to reuse our UI components, reuse code, avoid redundancy. 
and um, things like that. And we find that it's actually very common in most Android apps. Anytime you see a tab layout, you're probably seeing the use of fragments. Um, fragments have their own life cycle, uh, and we learned that their life cycle is attached to the activity life cycle. So if an activity gets destroyed, the fragment also gets destroyed. And we also learned that sending data between fragments can be a little bit um, complicated. It's not as simple as it was with activities because we have to send the fragment back to its host activity, which then delegates the sending to um, some other fragments. Uh, and the fragment manager enables a lot of fragment related processes. Um, we saw a little bit of syntax there. And um, we also seen tab layout navigation, which is a very common um, use of uh, the uh, fragments in a navigation system. And um, we also sort of scratched the surface a little bit of HTTP requests. So what are GET requests? What are POST requests? And we started thinking about these topics. Um, so uh, any questions on Flutter All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about data. So typically, um, well, one of the things that might come to mind, uh, one of the things we've operated with for data are bundles, right? Um, bundles are great for sending uh, general data, right? When we're sending something in an intent, um, sometimes uh, we'll put things in our bundle and then send it over. So, uh, like uh, in the very first Azure Homework 3, Homework 2, uh, when we're sending from the HSV to the uh, um, uh, RGB activity, you could have sent a bundle. Or rather than sending a bundle, um, uh, you could use some sort of uh, uh, like a repository, which we'll learn more about that if you want to keep some global data uh, that, that you want to save for system. So uh, just this idea that a bundle is a way that we can um, put data into something um, and then send that thing between activities. Um, and uh, typically, we think of this data as primitives or serializable. Um, primitive uh, is a term we learned from Java, but integers, um, things like that, uh, even though everything is an object in Kotlin. And uh, serializable, um, I'm pretty sure, just refers to the fact that it's like uh, like the bytes are sequential um, in terms of its structure, though. I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not positive. I, I'm pretty sure. But uh, basically, the way we see this is you put simple stuff in the bunch. That's that's uh, what we thought of that. We're putting things, you know, strings, stuff like that. Okay. Um, so now we're going to introduce a new topic of singleton. So singleton classes. So it's basically um, the way we can think about it is uh, a framework or uh, a data structure paradigm where a single class is instantiated once. So this holds data from across the app in one place. So it's sort of like a hub for your data across the um, different activities, different um, locations you might be in an app. And the holder ensures that there is only ever going to be one instance of this class. So I can't make three singleton classes of the same, or I can make three instances of the same singleton class. It would be a little bit problematic if I had a class that was uh, representing data and I was able to create multiple instances of it uh, because then. You know, I, if I change one, what does that mean about the other, which is truly the representative of or the representative of the data? Um, and so it's generally uh, found upon, um, but still super, super common. So, like, while we uh, told you guys not to use list views because it's not like industry standard, in this case, you should still use singleton, even though it's like not the best way to do it, it's still very, very common used in the industry. And so, uh, that's why we keep it. So uh, before we go into the rules, any any uh, questions about the idea of what a singleton class is? So it's like this class that holds data, we have a single version of it. And so that way, um, it can be accessed from other places uh, within our application. Any questions? Okay. So the rules for a singleton class is it must have a private constructor. Um, it must have a globally accessible object reference. So 
So this, this means that I can access it um, from anywhere. And the, you must have consistency across multiple threads. Uh, so the idea of threading and everything is a little bit complicated. We'll talk a little bit more about it um, when we talk about coroutines shortly, but um, you don't need to worry too, too much about this. So this is an idea of what the syntax would look like. So uh, we have a repository class. And we take note of the fact that this instructor is private. And then this is the companion object. So this object would be uh, accessible globally. And alternative, or and additionally, this is how you would be able to create an instance of it. So repository.get instance, given your context. And then you could say do something if your repository had a function defined in it. So your singleton class or repository class could have a um, maybe a function that like um, I don't know sorted it. So you could you could call on that function that do something function. So this is uh, basically how we're going to think about singleton classes. Okay. Um, so for storage. Uh, so shared preferences is something I wanted to mention. It's not something I think uh, you will have to use very frequently, but it's worth knowing about. Um, uh, and maybe you'll find it useful for the hack challenge. It's basically sort of like a, um, uh, it's a good place to store things like settings. So if, you, so if I created a setting where it's like, I want the refresh count of my app to be five seconds, then I shouldn't have to constantly re, uh, re configure my setting to be five seconds every time I open the app. So you're going to want to save what a user inputted for this setting. And we'll find that this is commonly done using shared preferences. Um, shared preferences is uh, like bundles. It has a key value pair. Um, and the implementation is pretty straightforward, not very difficult. So if you find yourself wanting to save um, like uh, settings, um, like if someone selected like dark mode on your app, this might be a good place to save that preference. Um, so it's uh, basically a good way to store this kind of thing. This is how we do this um, in Android. So if this is something you'd be interested in, something you think you might need for your app challenge app, take a look at the boilerplate code um, on the uh, textbook. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. All right, so we're going to dive back into networking now. Um, so uh, for the data and persistent storage, we'll see more of the details in a um, uh, demo, and there's a lot on the uh, textbook you can also look at. But um, in terms of implementation, it's it's really more of a syntax thing. Once you understand the concept of what you're doing, it's not uh, too difficult. So JSON, um, uh, we're going to just briefly go through what a JSON is in case you've never seen it. Um, so it stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, this file type, uh, is, which is .json, you'll find is uh, typically used in networking. Um, so the file received from network requests are typically in the form of a JSON. Um, so like uh, maybe it'll be like the JSON, uh, and then it'll have like the success status of your request, and then the data of your request, and this will be stored inside of the JSON. Um, and so the way JSONs work is they, they are key value pairs of objects and arrays. So if you see the squiggly bracket, it's an object. And if you see the square bracket, it's an array. So here, employee is the key, and the value is that array that you get. And then it's, uh, the array stores objects because we have a squiggly bracket. So this is object one, object two, and object three. The object one has, um, uh, two key value pairs. First name is the key, John is the value. Um, last name is the key, Doe is the value. So this is how we can um, understand uh, the JSON file. So um, any questions about JSON? Okay. So third-party APIs, this is something we want to talk about briefly in case uh, your application would use this. Um, and there's a lot of really great third-party APIs, and um, we want to learn how to re be able to read third-party APIs so we can use them in our app. Like the New York Times has a third-party API that you could use to like get articles. Um, you, uh, we, we've seen the Pixabay API um, from the last homework to get images. Um, 
Unsplash also has an API available. Uh, basically, there's a, uh, free public APIs for developers uh, just about everywhere. So, and having a good API can drastically change the amount of things that um, your app can do. So, imagine if you don't use, like, you create your app in a vacuum, you know, you're, you're sort of confined as to what you can create. So, um, you'll find that they typically will use JSON as return types, and by typically, I mean, like, 100% of the time. Um, and and uh, uh, they'll tell you what to expect from HTTP requests. They'll say, hey, if you make a get request like this, this is the sort of schema of what you can expect. It'll be, uh, maybe it'll say like the success status. It'll, it'll give you a JSON where the first field of success status did it go through, was it uh, actually successful, and then whatever data that you were getting. Um, and um, uh, the schema, by the way, I threw, I threw this word around, I think, five times. A schema is basically like the skeleton structure of a JSON. So it's like understanding the first field represents this, the second field represents this. Um, so uh, if you want to find some examples, uh, you can find in a lot of, I think, uh, APIs will actually give you schemas if you look at the docs. Um, but uh, homework six will involve reading an API for a backend. In this case, it's the API that either Gonzalo or Jack from backend had written up. Um, and it uh, uh, will tell you about what to expect from a GET request, what to expect from a POST request, and things like that. Um, and the hack challenge should involve it also. So uh, you'll be working with backend members, guaranteed for all of you. And so if, they're, uh, if you're expecting something from the backend, then you should tell them. And if they created a backend and you're not sure uh, like how it works, you should tell them, hey, can you give me um, like an API? Because at the end of the day, as part of their final submission, that they have to submit like a fully formed API. And it's sort of just like documentation, right? It's not that much overhead. So you should tell them, hey, please give me like an API so that I know how to make a post request. Um, but uh, it, it can be a little bit difficult to be working with backend concurrently because you might want to make Request, but a lot of the times you have to build the framework while they're also building the framework. And so hopefully the timeline for your group matches nicely. Okay, any questions about uh, JSON or third party API? Okay. So coroutines um, are uh, something we can think of as uh, sort of handling of network requests because network requests can be fairly daunting from a programming perspective. It can be uh, taking a very, very long time, um, and you don't want your app to just hang there while it's waiting to receive data, right? You want to be able to do things asynchronously. So this is the idea of being able to like run code asynchronously, running things on threads. So there's two sort of approaches. There is the approach of blocking, and then there is the approach of suspending. So generally, it's considered more favorable to use suspending. Suspending is when you actually have suspended the running of some function, some process. Whereas with blocking, it's sort of just in a wrapper and not actually being stopped. It's just, uh, it's still running on the thread. It's, it's still happening. And so it's, it's not quite, um, it's not quite as good from an efficiency perspective, and it's uh, less ideal for us. And so for this reason, suspending is uh, what we want uh, from the behavior. And this is, in fact, what we get from coroutines. So uh, coroutines do support suspending functions, where you can run uh, code concurrently without having to block uh, using some sort of wrapper. So this is this idea that if I'm blocking code, then it's basically taking place in some wrapper, uh, like on, you can think of it like similar to the backstack of fragments, right? When I'm throwing a fragment onto a backstack, it's like it's not currently present, but it still exists. You haven't killed it yet. And so this is sort of like the idea of blocking. Function A has not been killed, it's sort of like on a backstack, but it's still on the thread. Whereas suspending is actually uh, more optimal. And one of the nice things about coroutines is that it figures out the order uh, of what to um, uh, suspend and what's most optimal for it. So coroutines are really carrying a lot of weight in terms of network requests. Okay. So uh, 
So here's a little example. So run blocking is a way we can do a blocking function, while coroutine scope is a suspending function. So uh, ideally, suspending is what we want to do. But here's uh, some some uh, example here where we have delays. So the run blocking is going to uh, launch this task, and so. Uh, remember, this idea of blocking means that it's going to be like in a wrapper not taking place. And then the coroutine scope here uh, is going to then launch this task, which has a delay of 500. And then uh, within this coroutine scope, outside of the launch, we have another uh, delay here. And then we're finally printing. So, and this shows you the order of execution. This is a little uh, in depth. In terms of like understanding the difference at runtime, which isn't super important, but it is here uh, if you're uh, wanting to go more into it. But in the interest of time, we will keep it going. So all Kotlin coroutines run on something called dispatchers, and we have three types of dispatchers. We have main, I/O, and default. So it'll be like dispatchers.io, dispatchers.default, dispatchers.main. And so the use of them uh, for dispatchers.io, uh, we'll typically use this when making effort requests, uh, reading and writing to a file or a database. Um, and so uh, this is uh, essentially one that you will have some music in. Um, dispatchers.main for updating states, column suspended, and related UI functions. So basically, all of these things that you're seeing are things that could take quite some time. Right? If I'm if I'm doing a network request and I'm receiving like 10 megabytes of data, there's no and I have like like really bad internet. There's no guarantee, right, that I'll be able to populate my user interface with this data, right? So this has to be running in the background. It has to have some sort of um, uh, dispatcher. So basically, uh, uh, when I get this data, then I can proceed and do these things. And so it's this whole idea of order of execution, and sometimes you know, what if you've waited like 30 seconds and you still don't have it? Should you sign out? Should you let the uh, try, try to remake the network request? Maybe there was a dropped packet. And so there's this whole thing of trying to, you know, examine the behavior after you've coded it, see what makes sense. Okay. Uh, and so here is uh, some syntax example. Um, so we have some function yes, which is supposed to be uh, making some yes, and uh, with dispatchers.io, and then within this we are making the actual network call. So and from this we'll also get a result. So yes will return to us some result, and uh, then you can have maybe like some function that does something with the result called show, and we can uh, then. Uh, actually populated in the UI or something like this. Okay, and that's going to be it. Uh, any questions from the high-level perspective of networking, how to use these things? A lot of it is, uh, in my experience, for networking, to really understand it, you have to do it in specific case scenarios. Like, I had to uh, first, like, make a networking request to the OK HTTP library, and then I was like, oh, okay, this is really how it works. So uh, I know it can be a little bit confusing, so just try to understand what's going on from the higher level perspective right now. So any questions before we dive into the demo? <laughs> I mean, it's like nearly wrapping up the context of this. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it will. Right. Hey, y'all. Hope you all had a great Halloween and uh, did some relaxation. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. This should not be here.
Okay. So uh, today we're gonna make a, a smaller version of what you're gonna be making your homework. And what this app is gonna do, we're gonna work with the same backend that you guys are going to work with for your homework. And we're going to do uh, a few different things. For example, uh, fetching the list of notes stored in the backend, uh, you know, creating a, a new note to put, uh, to give to the backend and store there and also uh, storing some data locally on the Android phone. So that's the high level overview of what we're gonna do today and demo. Uh, before that, I wanna point out a few things like, uh, for example, that have to do like specifically with this assignment. Um, so in the Android manifest, um, you're gonna want to add this tag and this field in your application tag for this assignment. And this is like very unclear. So it's kind of unclear what this does um, on, on the surface, but basically what, what happens is that um, there are like, uh, if you've seen, if you've gone online and seen uh, a couple of different URLs, you've seen that like most URLs begin with like HTTPS, right? And you know the S shows that it's like a bit more secure, and that your data is more secure. Now the thing is, our our backend uses an HTTP uh, URL, and which is less secure. And Android phones typically do not actually allow you to make requests to those sorts of uh, backends unless you specifically specify otherwise. So yeah, it, it's a bit more complicated to set up an HTTP backend. So you're gonna have to include in order to actually make the request the back end. So that's like a small thing. All right, and yeah. Uh, also, we're gonna have some dependencies. Um, these are basically the same dependencies that uh, we gave you in the starter code for the last homework, but I just wanted to let you guys know that they're there because if you have um, basically, if you're not able to import some things, it's possibly because you haven't actually included the dependencies in your build up cradle. So you can go back and check with the starter code for the last assignment as well to make sure that you've got these dependencies so your app will compile. So that's like a bit more of a nitty gritty logistical, I guess you could call logistical stuff of programming. But yeah. Let's get started with the actual programming. So what we're gonna do is um, in our main activity, we want to um, have a recycler view. It's gonna display like a list of the notes uh, that are currently in the backend. And um, here I've already set up some like boilerplate stuff because I don't wanna do too much typing during lecture and then have you keep you guys for like 10,000 hours after lecture actually ends. So and uh, some of the code already here. Most of this stuff is stuff you've already seen. I'm just uh, you know, using find view by ID and setting some on click listeners. So this stuff is stuff that you've already seen. And what we're gonna do now is um, basically we're going to make a network request. This is interesting. Okay. Okay, I guess I didn't actually delete all the code. Oh. In that case, yeah, we are going to make a network request. And we are going to first start with a get request. So um, if you can see here, we have a recycler view that we found and we've uh, given it a layout manager. And we are going to uh, first, uh, make a get request. So I'm gonna explain some of the code that's uh, shown here. So if you go back up, up here, um, you will see that first we will be using OKHTTP to make our networking request. So that's the library that we're gonna be using to make our networking request and Furthermore, we're going to be using something called Moshi in order to um, 
basically create an adapter between JSON and um, the objects that we have uh, locally. So if Adam uh, just showed you that JSON is like, uh, basically it's sort of like a skeleton with a whole bunch of key value pairs. And what that sort of corresponds to is sort of, it can correspond to an object that you have like in the front end. To give you a more concrete example, let's look at this data class that we might use for uh, our recycle view. So this might be a typical data class that you might create in order to hold data that would be displayed in your recycle view. So um, if you notice, this data class also consists of a whole bunch of key value pairs. And um, what an adapter like Moshi does is it takes the JSON that you get from the backend and it looks at the key value pairs there and it sort of identifies the corresponding key value pairs here and populates the information. So for example, you might get a JSON that says, uh, let's see. You might have a JSON that has, you know, for example, body and some, some string and an ID and some integer, for example, in your JSON. And Mashi will basically take that and construct a note object with a body of string and an ID of zero. Does that make sense? Okay, so that is the concept of a JSON adapter. And one thing, one important thing to do in uh, after creating your data class, in order to have Mashi generate the adapter for you, you're gonna have to add this annotation on top of your data class. So at JSON class generate adapter equals true. That tells Mashi that, hey, this is a data class that I want you to generate an adapter for. And what the adapter does, again, is converting between objects that you have in Android and the JSON that the backend is sent to you. So it can convert back and forth between them. Any questions so far on any of the comments? All right, no questions so far, sounds good. All right, let's go back to our code. And, um, okay, so I'm going to first explain a few things, but I think I might need help from the actual API stuff. Do you know the URL for the backend API stuff? I think you sent it up to last. Yeah, wait, it's a, I think I'm not on it. Uh, all right, so we're first going to take a brief look at the API that you guys are going to be using for homework. So it's going to be forms. Uh, see you at the ah, there we go. Don't worry about the fact that it says iOS. Backends are universal, so then they work for both iOS. So um, this is uh, the type of object that we're going to be working with um, on the backend. Um, so this is the type of JSON that the backend will return, and you see that like my note object is kind of set up to sort of mirror this. One thing that's important to note is that if you want your JSON to be properly uh, uh, parsed by the adapter, you have to make sure that the names that you give uh, the fields in your data class match up exactly with how they're presented here in the JSON. Else you'll get some very funny errors about parsing um, because Machine is not smart enough to like, for example, make this P lowercase if you accidentally made that P lowercase in your data class. Okay, so if we look at this, we're gonna first uh, be using uh, hitting this endpoint, we want to get a list of all the notes that are on the backend. And um, so we see that we have to make a get request to the post endpoint. And I'm gonna further explain a bit more about that. Sorry, fine, end of the video. Okay, 
So here we call a method, a helper method that we call populate notes list because we want to make have a helper method to help us make our get request. And here is the actual code that we are going to use in order to make the get request. So this is a request and it is a uh, something that is provided by OKHTTP. And we say request.builder.url and we pass it this URL. And if you notice, this post corresponds to the post uh, endpoint that was on the API spec that we just saw. So we sort of want to match up this ending part with whatever we saw on the API spec. And base URL is something that uh, we give you. It's basically the first part of the URL, HTTP, yada, yada, yada. And we will give that to you so you, you make, you know, like the correct address to make the post to. Anyways, so we have that, we have the URL, and we basically want to uh, send a request to the URL to get something. Uh, any questions so far about the setup of this? All right, and yeah, let me just uh, briefly comment this out so far. Um, let me just briefly comment this out so I can sort of like explain it step by step. So uh, client.new call makes a new call uh, with this get request. So this is first how you start making the new call which is the get request. And the client we're using is the OKHTP client. So we're saying, hey, H, uh, OKHTP client, we are going to make a request and we're going to make this get request. And then we say, okay, after this request is done, we want to do something else. So we want to enqueue a callback. What this basically means is that we will have to wait for telling OKHTP to make the get request and then wait for the response. And after it gets the response, we want it to do something with that information. And basically, we want to create a, a callback object. And this is basically something that will take uh, whatever response was returned by the get request and do something with it. And in this case, I can implement members. This is similar to many of the interfaces you've implemented. You have to basically implement every single thing in the interface. And you don't really have to put anything in on failure if you don't want to, but if you want to, you can also print a helpful error message. For example, eat up that trace. But we can also sort of ignore that if you want. You can also print it. Uh, the more important thing is on response, which actually uh, gets the response. Uh, from the get request. So on a successful re uh, get request, the response would basically contain the JSON at the back end. And you can say, you know, response.use. And I'm going to briefly explain the syntax. Response.use basically allows you to refer to response using it. It basically sort of like renames the variable, renames response to it. And it's uh, useful just because sometimes you want to uh, have like shorter variable names without like worrying about the collision, naming collision. And um, you can first check if it's successful or not. So um, if the response is not successful, then you can do something. And for example, you can throw an exception or you can also like print an error message or like log an error message if you want to. So how you handle this error is up to you. However, um, if it is successful, then you want to uh, do something else. So I am going to explain this code here. So here is uh, where we are using our Moshi adapter. 
So we have a response. We want to use our MOSHI adapter to turn the JSON into some actual object that we have. And here is where we created our adapter. And uh, to create the adapter, MOSHI first has to know what type of object you're converting to. It has the JSON, it has to know what type of object you're converting to. And in this case, we say, okay, we are going to convert to a note class. But there's a caveat in this particular case. If we go back to our API spec, we see that get actually returns a list of posts, which means we're not just getting one, uh, say, note object, we're getting a list of them. And so just creating an adapter that handles one single note will not work here. So we have to do something else. And in fact, what we have to do is to use uh, this fancy little method here uh, that basically says, um, we are going to create a new type and this type is going to represent a list of notes. Um, fair warning, you cannot uh, just do something like uh, list note class.java or something like that, that's not gonna work. Just like in case you, you want to try that, it's not gonna work. And after you create this type, um, you tell Moshi, okay, I want to create an adapter with this type. So this type refers to this type right here. And we have successfully created a JSON adapter that's going to convert from some JSON to a list of notes. Any questions on how this was done? All right, sounds good. Okay, now go on, on. Okay, so for this block right here, after I get the note list, we have a local note list that we wish to populate. And afterwards, we can sort of use that to instantiate our adapter. Actually, right here, we do not actually really need this at all. We can just uh, instantiate the adapter directly using note list. So if you recall earlier, we had a recycler view and we need to create an adapter to actually populate it with data. So in our onCreate, uh, basically we set up the recycler view, but we haven't actually given it an adapter. So that's why we need to do that over here. Actually give the note adapter some data, construct it, and finally set the recycler view adapter to adapter. So, uh, one warning, if I do something like this and just say, okay, I want to set the recycler views adapter to adapter, your app will crash. And the reason that will happen is basically uh, Android gets very, very sad about not calling, uh, not accessing recycler view inside the original activity that created it. So Android is like, okay, main activity was the, was the activity that originally created recycler view. Nothing else is allowed to touch that. Especially, uh, and basically, unless you are the original activity that created the recycler view, you are not, not allowed to modify it, which is why we have to do something called run on UI thread, um, which you usually want to do when you're making UI changes and when you want uh, to do things that use the original activity. So this is just one thing that you want to use when you're making UI changes, or if you're getting any errors about not being able to uh, modify views that you did not originally create. Any questions about that? The get request? Do you mean that you cannot use recycler view in another function, even if you Oh, no, I mean, you can. It's just that, okay. Uh, here, basically, uh, this is a special case because okay, HTTP is like doing some like weird magic. You're, you notice that we never had to use coroutines here at all. And that's because okay, HTTP is doing like some weird magic that's running this on a separate thread. So inside this like whole block, okay, HTTP is like running this in a separate thread. And which means it's not running on the same thread as main activity. And you have to like, 
purposefully say run on UI threads in order to like make it basically do things that uh main activity knows about. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, any other questions? All right then. Okay, let's get to um, some saving some stuff locally. So um, if you, uh, Adam mentioned earlier that you had to create something uh, called a singleton class in order to, uh, and that's one way of storing things locally. And so we are going to create something like that right now. So we are going to create a new, uh, let's see. Kotlin class, and we're going to call it a repository. And we're going to give it a private constructor because we don't want any other, we don't want multiple instances of this thing floating around, basically. And we're going to give it a companion object. And you can think of things inside this companion object as being like, sort of like static variables in Java. So you can refer to anything uh, in this uh, companion object as like you would refer to something to like a static variable attached to a class in Java. Um, this is going to be a note. So I want to keep track of a list of notes in this repository. And how I would refer to this note list in any other activity is I would say, I would refer to it as like repository dot note list. So this is like extremely similar syntax to how you would access just static variables in Java. So basically we just created a singleton class with a sort of similar to a static variable that holds some notes, that holds a note list. So that's one way of storing information locally. And let's say that we wanted to store information that we like, let's say we wanted to edit a note. And then after we edited that note, we want to like store that edited note locally, right? So what we first want to do, we want to construct a note object with that new information. And then we want to say, we want to access the static variable from attached to repository. We want to access the note list and we want to say, okay, let's add something to this uh, uh, note list. And we can say, for example, if we wanted to store information, we can add our new updated edited note to the note list that we have in our repository. Any questions about this? About creating a repository, accessing it, how to modify the variables that are in it. Okay, any questions? And if you can notice, we just went to two different activities. We were an edit note activity, and then we went to another activity called local note activity. And both of them were easily able to access the note list attached to the repository. So that's the benefit of having a singleton class. Uh, basically, you have some class, and every single other class can access its static variables. And you don't have to do anything like passing uh, extras around with intent or anything like that. You can just say repository.note list, and it will give you the same exact note list that was previously modified in edit note activity. Question so far? Yes, no, maybe so. All right. Um, let's now go on to this. Okay, so I'm going to explain this a bit more because this is a bit complicated. So this time we want to make a post request. So we just went over get requests previously. We got a list of notes, but you know maybe we don't want just to make get requests. Maybe we want to make post requests to you know send the server some information that we have. You know maybe the user wants to create a new note, and we want to tell the server about this. 
And uh, so first, you know, if we want to construct a new note, we can say, okay, we want to construct a new note uh, and we want to give it a poster name and in some title. And same as before, we got request.builder.url and we give it the URL that we want to hit. And if we look briefly back at the API, we see that if we want to create a new post, we post to this endpoint. Post, and we double check that we have that. We do. We are hitting post. And finally, we go back and double check the schema. So what the backend is expecting in this case, it wants a JSON body with a, at the very least, a title, a body, and a poster. So you want to look at the API spec very carefully in these cases, because if you don't have these fields, the backend may sort of reject your request or return an error message, and your post will not, success, will not succeed. So you want to look at the API spec to make sure you send over actually all the fields that are required. And usually this is fine because you already in your data class, you have all those fields and you're required to provide them when you're constructing it. But it's something to always keep in mind whenever you encounter some type of networking error. And after we pass it a URL, we have to do something else. We have to pass it the information we want to post. So I will explain that here. So up here, we have another JSON adapter. Um, this is another Moshi adapter. And this time, because we are we looked at the backend spec and it is only expecting sort of the equivalent of one note object, this adapter's type is just going to be the note class. Just going to be the note class. And uh, you might wonder, why are we including like these like sort of like annotations, right? Like, and sometimes they're just like, why not needed? Like in here, for example, we don't actually need this type annotation. But in other instances, uh, the Kotlin type system is not like smart enough to figure out what type the adapter is. So whenever uh, you're in doubt and the Kotlin type system is complaining at you, add type annotations to your adapter. So that's just like a moshi side note. And um, any questions uh, or concerns about why I decided to use the note class for this moshi adapter? Nope. All right. So after we create the moshi adapter, we can say, okay, we can use the adapter and turn our new note object to JSON. So. So this first part right here is sort of the part that converts your uh, object to a JSON string. So this converts it to a JSON string. However, the issue is that we currently have a string type, but what, what the post method requires is something of type request body. So you have to do a, a second conversion from this string, which is a JSON string, to another type. And uh, you do that by calling this method dot to request body. And this media type is actually not entirely necessary, but you can use, uh, you can like include it um, if you feel that like not including it causes the backend error out. Uh, it basically tells the backend, hey, I am going to be sending a request body and it's going to be a, a JSON request body. I am sending the JSON. So sometimes it might be helpful if the backend is erroring out, you might want to include this. Yep. And finally, we build that. Any questions on how to build the get the post request? Got the JSON, convert it to a request button. Questions, yes, no? Okay. So this time we are going to do the same thing. We're going to make a new call with the request post and we are going to execute it. And 
Uh, the reason we use execute here is that I guess it's more convention to use execute when you're uh, using like a post request because in this case you're not like usually you don't really want to like wait for like a response. The response isn't like that informative, so you just like execute it instead of like waiting for the response. Although if you do want to use the response, you can check. You can still check, for example, if it's successful or not. and do some handling here. And also, um, if you have some response, which in this case, the backend will return a response, it'll return the new new object that was created. You can also do something with it, like um, get the response, get the body, turn it into a string, and Uh, store it in some value, and then you can do whatever you want with this response value. You can, you know, log it. You can, you know, create a toast with it. You can populate a text view with it. Whatever you want to do with it. So, if you have a response, if you get a response from the post request and you want to use it, you can still use it just as you can use it when you get it from a get request. It's the same process. Okay, any questions about the post request? I uh, sort of like went through it a bit fast, a lot of syntax stuff. Okay, any questions in general about either the get request, the post request, or how to create a singleton class? Um, yeah, we will be posting like, yeah, yeah, the demo code later on. Just, just this one. Yeah, no, because it's like, we kind of like cram, we had to cram like two lectures into one because the half challenge is cutting us down by one lecture. So that's, that's why this is a, a bit rushed. I apologize for that. So any final burning questions about life, the universe, or Android? Okay, another burning question. <laughs> okay, we will be lenient this time and take the max, but ideally don't uh, put us in that situation where we have to manually do stuff that CMS doesn't automatically do for us because we are more likely to mess up. All right, any other questions? Yeah, sorry for keeping you guys late, by the way. <laughs> Um, uh, one thing that I wanted to say, uh, so, um, since this is the last lecture, I just wanted to emphasize, um, uh, everyone, you, you did very well. Congratulations on making it this far. Um, uh, but, uh, we encourage you all to apply to the Android team, uh, on Actia. Uh, we typically give, um, like, a, a an advantage to people who had taken our class and so um, we love seeing familiar faces and um, definitely do consider applying. Oh, should we go over the homework? Wait, what the homework is? Sure. Uh, by the way, in case you didn't pick it up from demo, what the homework is this week is it's a notes app. So you can create a new note and um, uh, in the, you'll do like a post request with your notes so that it gets synced to the back end. You can pull all of the notes. Um, and you'll have an ID, which you should put as your net ID. I mean, this is all in the, the write up, but the ID lets you, you, you can like filter to see what's only your notes and what are notes from like everybody who's posted to the back end. And so you'll be able to edit notes and you'll also be able to post notes. Yeah. Oh, and no, inappropriate content on any of the notes. Yeah, because like everyone else is going to be able to see it. Yeah, so let's, let's see. 
smart. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it for today. All right, yeah, that's it for today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.